Kind of a wet and sloppy day here today. My name's Juan Brown, you're watching the Blanco Lirio channel and let's go inside the hangar and meet the new Husky. This is the 1997 Aviat Husky A1 aircraft, November 4, Quebec, Romeo. I knew this aircraft when it was purchased brand new in 1997 by my friend Bart Reby, a local auto parts store distributor owner, and he brought this aircraft here to Nevada County and flew it and enjoyed it for nearly 20 years, putting on almost 2,000 hours onto this aircraft. Let's take a quick clip. Bart, I finally ran into Bart here recently and uh, had him come up and check out his old airplane and <laughs> he was proud to see that it was brought back home here to Nevada County Airport. All right, now we'll do something different. Get over here. <laughs> this time I'm gonna say who it is. This is Bart Reby. He used to own Fort Quebec Romeo, didn't you? you uh, I did. I remember when you originally bought this in 1997, first Husky here at Nevada County Airport. It was. Yeah, it was a proud day. We, we flew this back from uh, Afton, Wyoming, brand new airplane. First time I'd ever bought a new airplane. Uh -huh. I'd, I'd owned some used ones, but I never owned a new one. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a sensation. It is a sensational airplane. I, I never enjoyed uh, anything more than this one to fly. You, what, you put about 2,000 hours on it? Yeah. You owned it for a good long time? Yeah, I did. We, uh, I flew this, uh, uh, you know, I get a couple hundred hours a year in usually. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, Flew it a lot of places, took it back to uh, Florida and down to the Keys, wow. and up to Canada and down to Mexico and all over the United States. Really? And, yeah. Huh. Had some good trips in it. I thought you were just local flying. No, no. Man. We, yeah. Well, you know, fair weather flying. Yeah. So, uh, but no, we had some we had some real good flights in this thing. Took some long trips with it uh, and uh, got into some, you know, Tight spots, some short, some short uh, field landing, a lot of that, a lot of pastures and yeah. levees, and you know, spots you wouldn't normally land in an airplane. It's pretty good for that kind of. Yeah. It's good, good piece of equipment to be doing that. Yeah, with. yeah. super short. Yeah, yeah, uh. keep it, yeah, it likes it likes short. <laughs> <laughs> and you always enjoyed it with the 850 tires on for the most part. Yeah, I, at one time I did put larger rubber on it, uh, mm -hmm. not as big as you got now, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, I went back to the 850s just because I, I like the airspeed, especially mm -hmm. if we were traveling long drift. Yeah, just, and you know, the A1s are the fastest of the Huskies. Yeah. You get this up to altitude and lean it out and you can toot along pretty good. Um, what is it about the A1 that you like over the later model Huskies? I think the A1 is, you know, it doesn't haul as much weight but it's not really a factor because you don't do that with it, mm -hmm. but it's faster, it's lighter on the controls, it takes off in a shorter distance, they don't want to tell you that, but it will, and uh, it's just a better performing airplane, I think, all, all around it's a better flying airplane. Uh-huh, and uh, the ailerons on the A1s versus the later model ones, you think uh, you, you prefer the earlier model? Yeah, the ailer I've, I've flown the, the later model ailerons, they're a little quick, mm -hmm. you have to be a little careful with those. Uh, these are a little more proportionate, hmm. where you know you move the stick so much you get the same amount of reaction. Those, the more you move the stick, pretty soon you start getting twice as much uh, 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 action out mm -hmm. of the ailerons. So you got to be a little careful with them. Mm -hmm. 
but yeah, overall, I think this is a better setup. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Bart Raby, former owner. The, the, I'm basically the third owner. There was a second owner, but that only lasted a short amount of time. So when I saw four Quebec Romeo show up for sale in the Controller magazine back at the factory at Afton, Wyoming, I knew the history of this airplane from day one. And so I jumped on it and brought it back here to Nevada County Airport, its old home. There you go. Well, I'm glad you did. Maybe I'll get a chance to fly again. <laughs> Let's someday. do it. Yeah. 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 All right. All right. Thanks, Bart. You bet. So last November, there I was flat on my back reading the Barnstormers and Controller classified ads dreaming about airplanes when I saw this ad for November 4 Quebec Romeo for sale at the Afton, Wyoming factory. I nearly jumped out of bed. It was what, Thursday night? Friday I called the, the factory and said, yes, it's still here, it's available. I tried to wire them some money right away on Friday. It was too late in the day for that. So I hopped on a smoker and headed out to Salt Lake City and up to Jackson Hole, Wyoming on Sunday. <laughs> Monday morning was beating on the door of the factory there saying open, open, open with a check in my hand to get November 4 Quebec Romeo back home to Nevada County. Because I'd known this aircraft its entire time. I knew the impeccable maintenance history that was done on this aircraft. I knew about the damage history that was performed on this aircraft and the job that the factory had done to rebuild it to its current state. The Aviat Husky design has been around since 1996. The impetus for this design to come forward was oddly enough a increase in popularity of monoplane aerobatic aircraft in aerobatic competition and the subsequent waning of interest in the Pitts Special Biplane or biplanes in general in unlimited aerobatic competition. As material science got better and better and carbon fiber became more and more a reliable building platform for monoplane aircraft they could withstand the rigors of aerobatic competition they took over in popularity over the biplane design. Why, what did that have to do with this aircraft? Well, the Aviat Aircraft Company in Afton, Wyoming was at the time and is still to this day the builder of all certified Pitts Special aircraft. They got the design rights, they worked it out with Curtis Pitts himself. Of course, that aircraft was originally a home-built aircraft. And Aviat produced the production versions of the Pitts Special. They also worked with Frank Christensen. Frank Christensen was also working with Curtis Pitts to try to get the Curtis Pitts biplane design certified and in, in production. Unable to get the rights from Pitts, Frank produced his own improved design on the Pitts S2, the Kristen Eagle, and revolutionized kit building with his incredibly complete aircraft kits. Production kind of wound down on those aircraft. The factory wanted to keep busy building something, so they attempted to get a hold of the Piper Super Cub type certificate and start building those aircraft new again. But it was over a million dollars at the time to get that type certificate, so they decided we'll start a new STOL type, STOL, short takeoff or landing type aircraft design from scratch. We'll take everything that we like about the Piper Super Cub and those things that we don't like about the Piper Super Cub and build something that's a little beefier or a little bit huskier than the Piper Super Cub and thus the Husky design was born. The primary difference between the Piper Super Cub and the Husky is the Husky started out with the 180 horse Lycoming engine with a constant speed prop as opposed to the original Super Cub design, which came out with a 150 horse. Well, the original original came out with a smaller engine than that and had a long history, but primarily Super Cubs at the time were 150 horse powered aircraft. So in the end, they ended up building an aircraft that was a bit bigger and beefier and stronger and faster, considerably stronger or faster than the Super Cub aircraft. So not only now could you get in and out of short strips, but you can also get there <laughs> in less than one day or less than two days. For example, if I want to go from here to Idaho, 
I can now get there in a reasonable amount of time to the good airstrips in Idaho in something like a Husky as opposed to Super Cub speeds. Because these Huskies will go about 120 miles an hour if you got the smaller tires, maybe 130 miles an hour as opposed to Super Cub kind of speeds. So let me get the GoPro camera out and show you some of the exquisite handcrafting construction that goes into building one of these aircraft. The empty weight of the A1 model Husky is about 1,200 pounds. The gross weight is about 1,700 pounds. This gross weight was increased in subsequent year models of the Aviat Husky. They're up to the A1C model now, and some of the Huskies even come with a 200 horsepower fuel-injected Lycoming engine. But as the aircraft increased in gross weight, the empty weight of the aircraft increased slightly as well. One of the biggest differences in the A1 series of Husky aircraft as opposed to later models is the wings. First off, anytime you're dealing with a Husky aircraft, you gotta wear a dang bicycle helmet when you're pre-flighting the thing. These are the flap hinges. This is why they're marked red and white, and they've got these foam head knockers on here to keep you from scalping yourself every time you walk underneath the wing. On the ailerons of the early model Huskies are these spades. This is a throwback from the biplane aerobatic period. These spades act like aerodynamic power steering. As you pull the aileron like that, this spade scoops up air and helps push the aileron further, easing the pressure on the controls so it helps to lighten the control loading. Now this is done differently nowadays in the, in the uh, more modern wing design. The ailerons on the early model Huskies have a relatively long span and a fairly narrow cord and are assisted by these spades. In fact the cord on these ailerons are shorter than the cord on the flaps. Later model Huskies they increased the span of the flaps reduced the span on the ailerons, and increased the cord of the ailerons. Aviat also introduced a wide slot in front of the ailerons and introduced aerodynamic mass balancing of the aileron in lieu of the spades. Here she is with the flaps all the way down, 30 degrees of flaps, there's three notches of flaps. Sometimes referred to as a slotted semi-fowler flap. The flaps are mechanically actuated right here. We'll come in and take a look at the panel here in a second. The wings on the Husky are huge. They've got a constant cord design and a high lift airfoil and produces one of the lightest wing loaded aircraft designs in the market today. Couple that with 180 horsepower. <laughs> she climbs like a homesick angel, as they say. I get uh, 1,000 to 1,500 feet per minute out of, uh, out of here, Nevada County, at three to 4,000 feet density altitude. The fit and finish on the Aviat Husky aircraft is just phenomenal. They've got expert craftsmen, craftsmen and craftswomen back there in Afton, Wyoming that do all the hand labor of putting one of these aircraft together. This paint design, for example, it's all hand taped. This is, of course, fabric covered aircraft and the fabric covering is screwed on to the aluminum ribs here and then these ribs are taped over with additional fabric to prevent chafing. A very sturdy design. Why fabric covering overall? It's lightweight. Underneath the fabric covering on the fuselage is a very, very strong 4130 chrome moly structure, much like a dragster, providing an extremely safe airframe, an extremely crash-worthy airframe. Again, why fabric covering besides the lightweight and the strength underneath it? You can take this thing off road or in the bush and you can poke holes in the fabric and get home. It's easily repairable, especially back there on the tail, which gets a lot of damage if you do a, a lot of extensive bush work. On an aircraft like the Luscombe, those parts are very hard to find and a lot of work to replace or rebuild on an aluminum covered aircraft. Here's the uh, stall warning same as on a Cessna. And like the Super Cub design, the aileron cables are brought out along the wing strut and then out to the aileron. 
For a stall type aircraft, the Aviat Husky is a pretty clean aerodynamic design. By tucking in the bungee landing gear system inside the fuselage, that's one way they cleaned up the design over the Super Cub. Back here on the tail, They got rid of the worm screw style trim system here and just fixed the, the stabilizer. The stabilizer is further supported here and there and there. And there's no trim tab on the elevator. Now this looks like a baggage door here, but it's not. It's a uh, maintenance panel. Let me pop in here and show you what's going on. And when I first saw Ford Quebec Romeo back at the factory in Afton, Wyoming, when I popped this panel and stuck my head in here and took a good deep breath of that new airplane smell, I was sold. <laughs> Too bad this isn't smell-o-vision, but you gotta come in here and check this out. Brand new construction, as this aircraft has been rebuilt. So here's your 4130 chrome molly, very, very strong fuselage structure that's covered with the Seconite fabric. Aluminum stringers help make the shape of the fuselage. Here's your battery down here. Here's your elevator push rod <clears throat> going back to the elevator. Here's your flap flap control cables right there. The fuel system we'll talk about in a minute. Here's some of your fuel lines here. A very, very simple and robust fuel system. Let me get a flashlight here so we can see better what's going on. There, now we can get a little closer look at what's going on down the fuselage. But right here, these two springs, that's your trim system. And that's something that takes some getting used to in the Husky, but it's part of their aerodynamically clean design. Let me show you up in the cockpit. When you trim the Husky, you are trimming, tightening up or loosening up those springs that I just showed you. So as you pull the trim back, it pulls the whole stick and elevator back. We're leaving the load on the pilot. So flying this aircraft, you have to very carefully manage that trim system to get your best landings out of this. I like to come in the pattern, say 65 miles an hour, two notches of flaps, get it down to 65, trim the aircraft for 65 miles an hour. When I come in over the fence, I want to be over the fence at about 60 miles an hour. I got to give that last little bit of trim, full up trim, to really dial in the round out and landing, which will occur at the full stall at about 53 miles per hour indicated airspeed. Remember, an aircraft can stall at any airspeed. It can only stall at one critical angle of attack. They've added handles here for handling, moving the aircraft around, and your standard Scott tailwheel in the back. A lot of folks upgrade to the baby bush tailwheel. On pre-flight, you want to pay particular attention to what's going on back here, as there's a lot of vital connections going on right back here at the tail, and it gets hit pretty hard sometimes out there in the bush. Just an exquisite fit and finish on these aircraft. So the paint we're looking at here, this paint is 10 years old from when this aircraft was first rebuilt about 10 years ago. The paint you see on that right wing is only about one year old and you just can't tell the difference between the two. So what about the damage history on this aircraft? This landing gear design on this particular A1 had a uh, the early design attempted to add a float plane, float plane fitting to this critical juncture right here. 
after nearly a couple thousand hours, this weld failed on the original landing gear, and this this gear sprung out like that, nailed the prop and uh, and a wing tip, and so the owner Bart Reby had the aircraft completely rebuilt, all new fabric, the works, and at, at about that same time had the engine overhauled as well as it was getting close to TBO, 2,000 hours. About two years ago or so, Bart sold the airplane to a second owner. That second owner apparently refused any additional instruction in the aircraft, dual instruction, and pretty quickly ended up ground looping the aircraft. It's a tail dragger aircraft. These are very easy to ground loop, just like any tail dragger aircraft. So the aircraft went back to the factory for a second rebuild, and that's where they rebuilt the right wing. During that rebuild, they also added this Hartzell Trailblazer propeller. This is just the fantastic, this is what makes this early model A1 a really fantastic aircraft. This lightweight composite prop by Hartzell, the Trailblazer, removes all the harmonic uh, issues that the original metal prop had on it and really pulls, pulls like hell and, and is a very quick responding propeller as well to RPM changes. So along with the new prop, they took a look at the engine. Well, they had to split the case of the engine again, even though it had less than 200 hours since major overhaul. They decided, well, there's a little bit of rust on some of these cylinders from uh, sitting around, basically. And so they went ahead and bought all new cylinders. So four new pistons and cylinders, whole new top end, new prop, a new carburetor to match the new prop, two new magnetos. Let's take a look inside. Then it's the four cylinder Lycoming 0360 aircraft engine, 180 horsepower. Oil goes in there, oil cooler there, four cylinders, dual spark plugs, just like any, just like all the aircraft engines. A little bit of a tight fit to get in there. Dynafocal mount, engine mounts. Just a beautiful job on the rebuild of both the airframe and the engine. So the idea is to provide, <laughs> I've owned a lot of old airplanes before. I've owned a lot of airplanes in the past and I finally wanted to get an airplane that I didn't have to work on all the time or I didn't have to spend half the day just or days or weeks trying to find obscure parts for an obscure aircraft. These aircraft have all the parts readily available, full factory support right there at the factory for all the year makes and models all the way through, making them a very easy to own and maintain aircraft. And hopefully with all the work done on this aircraft, as long as I don't ground loop it or prang it, it should provide years of trouble-free flying. Let's go take a look at inside the panel. By the way, these, these are the uh, Alaskan 29 inch bush wheels. I've added those. To tell you the truth, the 850s really are all the wheels you need if you're just doing dirt runway operations, hard packed dirt runway type of operations. Most all of the fields, the airfields that are on an aeronautical chart that are not paved, you can easily access with 850s in dry conditions. So when you really go off-road, like in gravel, riverbeds, or that sort of thing, where these larger wheels really start paying off. But on pavement, they're big and they're clumsy. You gotta be careful with them and 
you, uh, they're expensive. They're expensive as hell. A pair of these is like $5,000. And every time you land on the paved runway, you're stripping off, I don't know, five, ten dollars worth of rubber each time. So, <laughs> so you, being the cheap airline pilot, you're tempted to just land as close as you can to your hangar or wherever it is that you're trying to get to. <laughs> you're almost hover taxiing like a helicopter to get to your spot instead of <laughs> Stripping off rubber off of your expensive bush wheels. One of the things I like about the A1 Husky is it's got the lower or smaller instrument panel. Later models of the Husky, some of them have a much taller panel, which enables you to get some of the latest large electronic style instruments in the aircraft. But I like this original panel, which has the classic six-pack IFR panel. So it means you got a vacuum pump to run a artificial horizon and, of course, an electric turn and bank indicator and a, even an ILS. That's where these appeal to uh, professional pilots and airline pilots, I think, because they, they've got some, cro some real cross-country capabilities. But that adds weight, and that means you're... It's costing you in your short field performance. Slightly, not much. So over here we have the throttle, and then the uh, red mixture, and then the black knob is the propeller, controls the constant speed propeller, mags, carburetor heat over there. It's got a great cabin heater. Oh, and look at the uh, <laughs> yacht style finish on the floorboards. They're always an impressive touch on these Huskies. And I had to use that heater getting out of Afton, Wyoming. I think it was the last aircraft getting out of Afton, Wyoming in November until next spring. That snow starts settling in there in November and doesn't leave for many months. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, there's the flap handle over there. Elevator trim. The push to talk button on these Huskies is on the throttle instead of on the top of the stick. So that takes a little getting used to. There's even, in this particular aircraft, oxygen capability for your high altitude hopping over the mountain hops. And a baggage compartment in the back with a 50 pound limit. One of the disadvantages of the A1 model of Husky is there's no baggage door. You gotta come in through here to access your baggage. Later model Huskies all have access to a baggage door located right about in this area here. The Husky has a very simple fuel system, two 25-gallon tanks, which you can access right there from the uh, top of the wheels. And both tanks run simultaneously all the time. You've got a real simple fuel gauge. Now that fuel gauge does not read accurately in the three-point position on the ground. It only reads accurately in the air when you're in level flight. So on the ground, it'll tell you you've got substantially more fuel in your tanks than you actually do. And there's the other fuel gauge right there. Both tanks run simultaneously with the help of the, well, there's a crossover vent right there. And the fuel selector is located right down there. So I just leave it in the on position and leave it alone. Making fuel management very easy in the Husky. Another great thing about the Husky is the night flying capability. All of the lights work. All the post lights in the panel, which is a first for me. I've never had an airplane with all the lights work. And the Grimes lights for the overhead lights of the instrument panel and map lighting as well. So very well set up for instrument and night flying. Of course, there's strobes and nav lights out there as well. One thing about the Husky and most of these tube and fabric aircraft are they are very noisy. So a set of Bose noise canceling headsets is almost required in one of these. But I'm ha having a hell of a time working out my audio with my video uh, using this Bose noise canceling headset arrangement. One of the ideas with getting the Husky too is it's fantastic aerial photographing platform. These doors and windows can be left open at any airspeed and this window here can be rolled back and left open as well. It's just been so cold lately I haven't been able to really get out there and use it. 
open it up and get the uh, camera rolling without any plexiglass reflections in the camera. Now getting in and out of the Husky is always a challenge. Once you're in there, it's a very comfortable aircraft to sit in for many hours at a time. And with the 50 gallons of fuel burning about eight gallons per hour, you've got a lot of duration on this aircraft. 120 miles an hour, that's a fair amount of range as well. And that's another big advantage over some of these carbon cub designs is the carbon cub is so designed lightweight that it also has a limited fuel capability as well. So a carbon cub is more designed for a very specific short field purpose, whereas this is a more general all around design. Hopping into the back seat of the Husky is pretty easy. Just hop up on the stirrup and get in there. But the front seat's a little funny. So let me hike up my britches here first. <coughs> want to just sit right there on this lingerie and then grab the grab the bar there and slide on in. Another trick which I didn't do this time is you should have that elevator trim in the down position get that stick out of your way but once you're in position here strapped in with your five-point harness it's just very comfortable safe good visibility over the nose Except again with these bigger wheels, if you're in an uphill airstrip that's narrow, over this bump. your visibility is somewhat limited over the nose of the aircraft. Boy, I can't see a flipping thing. There we go. Just a good, comfortable, sweet flying, very stable design. You, this is one of the few aircraft I've ever owned where it is truly hands-off, trimmed hands-off flying for hours and hours at a time. And with the fuel system coming down evenly on both sides, it, it never gets out of balance. You don't have to fiddle with the fuel system to keep the wings level. Now the original owner of this aircraft, Bart Reby, his dad, Del Reby, was a long time, lifelong personal friend of General Chuck Yeager. And of course, Chuck Yeager lived up here in the Grass Valley area for many, many years. So with the relationship between Bart and Chuck Yeager, the two of them flew this aircraft quite a bit. And in fact, Chuck Yeager flew this aircraft quite a bit solo. He never owned the aircraft, this particular Husky. He he flew it, he borrowed it basically from Bart Reby. After this aircraft went back to the factory for its rebuild and it was down for so long, Chuck Yeager bought another Husky A1, I believe it was a C or a B model, and that's the Husky you see in the pictures with Chuck Yeager that have the little Bell X1 painted on the left hand side of the cowling. But this aircraft, uh, before, it had it, before it got rebuilt, had this more classic, this was uh, Reby's design idea, the more classic Piper lightning bolt design on the side of the aircraft. And there's General, General T Chuck Yeager. I believe this is a young Eagles flight that he's uh, giving some, some young folks a ride in the Husky. And there's the original owner, Bart Reby, flying in Fort Quebec Romeo. So that's the Aviat Husky. Let's go flying. And getting out of it. See, as you get older and fatter, it's a little bit of a challenge. You can see me now. Primer's in the lock, make sure rich. Look out, clear! All right, pre flight checks are done, cigars check is done. Departure briefing or departing on runway 25, flaps 10 will be a left downwind departure. We're going to go 500 feet, anything below 500 feet, land straight ahead. Above 500 feet, we'll start this turn to the right and then a left downwind turn, set ourselves up for an emergency return above 500 feet. We should be off the end of the, just off the end of the runway at about that altitude by then. We'll use the top of the white arc or about 72 miles an hour for our DMMS defined minimum maneuvering speed which will also be 
the speed we'll be accelerating to on the climb out. Best rate of climb, not the best angle of climb. Nevada County Traffic, Husky 4, Quebec Romeo, departing 2-5, left downwind, Nevada County. Let's go up, take a look at the snow. Final's clear, the pattern is clear. Mags are both, mixture's rich, prop is in, flaps are set, trim is set. Fuel's on, on, there's no both, it's just on. So we'll do a kind of a three-point attitude takeoff. Accelerate and ground effect, get the flaps up, then head for 72 and climb on out. Keep an eye on the cylinder head temperatures as we do this. A little bit of left crosswind. Temperature and pressure check good. Time hacking, we're out of here. Accelerate here, ground effect, lower the flaps. 72, trim, trim, trim. Look at that. 400 degrees on the CHT, 1,000 feet per minute. A little less than 72. Coming up on 2,400 feet. See, right now we'd still be going straight ahead. We got a problem, we got a field right down here. We're just coming up on, man, we're not even to the end of the field yet. Here's the end of the field, there's my 500 feet. Coordinate your turn, Brownie. Fade off here a little bit to the right. Now we've got enough altitude to make it back around to the airport. There's our two other landing options. There's a the runway right there. You'd really have to dump the nose to make that runway. Keep your speed up. All right, let's bring her back. Let's go for 2,500 RPM. There's the runway right there. Lowering the nose, going for a higher speed, getting those cylinder head temperatures down. And look at the beautiful Sierra today. Let's go check it out. the kind of vertical performance I'm talking about in the Husky. I mean, look at that, still at a thousand feet per minute. Bring it back to 72, see what we get. This is it 2,500 RPM? Quebec Romeo, 4 North, Crosswind Entry, 2-5, Nevada County. Okay, this will be a flaps 2, or 20 degrees flaps, 2 notches. 3-point landing, runway 2-5 in Nevada County. We've got a slight breeze out of the south. might have a quartering tailwind. Slightly. Very light winds. Port Quebec Romeo left crosswind 2-5 Nevada County. Nobody fixed the takeoff. Runways and taxiways are all plowed. Port Quebec Port Quebec Romeo left downwind 25 in Nevada County. Now we got that overshooting wind, so I'm gonna widen out my pattern here a little bit. That is the wind is coming this way, and I gotta go that way. Come on with a little bit of carb heat. Start reducing the power back. Already too high for the pattern. Correcting. Trim 
trim, trim, trim. Get her in the wide arc. One, two notches of flaps. Now trim nose down a little bit for that 65. That's good. For Quebec Romeo left base 25, Nevada County, full stop. Power is off. <clears throat> so we'll 65, go 65 around here. And then uh, pitch for 60 on final. We want to land three point in the stall at about 53 indicated. And I feel that little lift here as we approach the ridge. Finals clear. Get rid of some of this altitude here. Without picking up airspeed. We'll see what I mean about the Husky being a clean airplane. You dump the nose, you're gonna pick up plenty of airspeed real quick. You hear that? Oh, I didn't pitch. See? I didn't... <laughs> I didn't do that, that last little bit of trim for um, 60, so I was fighting that flare a little bit, botched it all up. Anyway, pretty dang short landing. There's the boys are watching. We gotta go try that again. Mixture's rich, prop is in, trim is set, flaps are set. For Quebec Romeo, depart in 2-5, Nevada County. Carb heat is in. Temperature and pressure looks good. We're out of here. Accelerate ground effect. Bring the flaps in, trim, get for 72, check the CHT, climb, 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 look at that, homesick angel, there's your 70, 72 or so, let's get up to 500 feet before we make any changes to our plan, engine failure straight ahead, until right about here, now we can start thinking about returning to the airport. Port Quebec Romeo left crosswind, 2-5 Nevada County. Coming back off on that power now, let's go for 2,500. I like that cylinder head. Once the engine's warmed up, and the oil's warmed up, the cylinder head temperature stayed down in the initial climb. For Quebec Romeo left down wind, 2-5, Nevada County. So that whole pattern approach and landing started with being too high here on the downwind. And then I failed to get that last little bit of trim. Remember I said on the uh, briefing on the ground there, I like to trim for 65 and then retrim for 60. But because I was hot and high and trying to kill that altitude, I missed that part and blew the landing. A little bit of carb heat. Or Quebec Romeo left base 25, Nevada County, full stop.
They're in the wide arc. One, two notches of flaps, props in. We're pretty well trimmed for 65 here. And we got just a little bit more trim to go for 60. Finals clear. This is where I want to be more down in the slot for my aim point right at the end of the runway or right at the end of the numbers. Okay, now we can work our way back to 60 miles an hour, get that last bit of trim in there, see? Still a little high, quite a bit high, but I don't want to dump the nose. See, it'll come down. Yeah, baby, you just never can tell when the bottom is going to drop out of it. Got to be ready on that power. Give it a little burst of power. Don't overdo it. Don't float and flare. These Huskies are a challenge, man. They're a great, great challenge. Great way to keep your flying skills from getting rusty. Thanks for flying with me today. We'll see you here.